Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everyone that is here in this building to worship this morning. I also want to welcome all those that are out there in the Zoom world to worship this morning. Um, also, any guests that we have today that this may be your first time that you're here, we want to welcome you also. All are welcome. We believe that you come as you are, not as you think others should expect you to be. We come here because we know that we, that together, it is not about this place being for the perfect people of God in the sense of being what you think is the perfect person. God created you good. God created you the way that you are. And when we are together, we remind each other of God's love in our life. We preach the love of Jesus Christ in this place. We sing to God's glory. And we have somebody on Zoom that's trying to... <laughs> Scott, I'll wait till you get that figured out a little bit or just turn your speakers down. There you go. So we like to say each and every day, but especially on Sunday mornings, this is the day that the Lord has made, and so we... Amen, amen, amen. As we prepare for worship this morning, let us listen to some music as we get our hearts and souls ready.
Tom, I don't have a light on my power button. We like everybody to be able to hear. Right. Join me in the call to worship. Come and give thanks to our God. Sing praises to the holy name. With the melody of the lute and the harp and the song in our hearts, we declare God's steadfast love in the morning and faithfulness at night. God's works make us glad. Your works are great, O God. We sing our praises of joy to you. The opening prayer. O God, maker of all that is beautiful, Jesus gave us the seeds of your justice and peace. In this time together, touch us, teach us, inspire us to sow those seeds through our ministries so that all may share in creation's abundance to make true the promise that no one will know the scarcity and no one will suffer deprivation in this community and beyond. Amen. Amen. Um, that session on Thursday, we have approved that singing is allowed with masks. So join me in hymn number 29, verses 1, 2, and 3. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, God of the swirling stars, how does the creature say I? the creature say praise. God of the earthquake, God of the storm, God of the trumpet blast, how does the creature cry out? Oh, how does the God of the rainbow, God of the cross, God of the empty grave, how does the creature say grace, how does the creature say It is only by the power of God that we are able to stand against evil. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Gracious God, you are our being generous. You give us the gifts of the Spirit, which enable us to have so much. We forget, however, that we have been recipients of other people's generosity. Believing that what we have is ours, we forget that all we have is yours. Forgive us. Help us to remember that being made in your image, we should be as generous as you. Amen. Let us take a time of silent confession.
sometimes that part of silently confessing. Sometimes it seems like we give too much time. Sometimes it seems as if there is never enough time. It's that part where we confess not just those sins that we do, but it's also the sins of not doing, not being open, not expressing God's love as we know God has intended us to do by being who we are. And so I want to assure you of this. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a humble spirit and a contrite heart. By God's steadfast love for us, we are forgiven. Now stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. I declare to you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Called to be one in Christ Jesus, we are made to love one another in the unity of grace. Let's share the sign of unity and the grace that we pass of Jesus Christ with one another this day. The peace of Christ with you and the way that we've been doing it in the congregation comes from the sign language of the peace of Christ be with you. So the peace of Christ be with you. The sermon and the scriptures that we have this morning as we are preparing ourselves to hear, preparing ourselves to interact with these scriptures this day. Let us pray for the prayer that we have printed in our bulletins, the prayer for illumination. Holy, holy, holy one, guide us by your spirit of the truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory and honor and praise to your threefold name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the three scriptures that I will be reading and I will be preaching through these three scriptures. The first is from Ezekiel and then we'll go to Mark and then we'll go to the Corinthians. The way that I look at this is that the what I call the Hebrew scriptures that as you all probably know them as the Old Testament. But to me, the Old Testament is not old. The Old Testament, again, is a testament of God. Again, the New Testament is a testament, particularly to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when we get to the epistles, we get a chance to see how the early church responded to this good and miraculous gift that God has given us. The title that I have is, What Can We Compare the Kingdom of God? So within that, it is the Kingdom of God, which I will emphasize to some degree. But I want to do is, I want to give you this introduction statement. And within this, it'll get unpacked in my sermon. But I say this, 
God will do what God will do. God is the reason for all that there is. God is the great I am, not us. And yet God has given us this unique gift, the gift of life eternally. It is what some call the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It is our true home and it is up to us to live in the kingdom in such a way that we bring glory to God through our love of God and neighbor. I want to read to you a poem, and you all probably know this poem. You might have memorized it in school, and you can probably re recite it much better than I. It's called Trees by Joyce Kilmer. It was written back at the turn of the century. Trees, and in this idea of trees, because Ezekiel is going to talk about trees. When you look out there at the bushes in the side there, or maybe you can look at a, a, a tree out the window there, the trees, they are incredible, marvelous examples in many ways of what the kingdom of God is like. It has deep roots that you'll never see. It has branches that reach out. A tree always gets its branches knocked off. It gets its bark eaten by animals. It, it is affected by the world around it. And yet when we see it, we see its beauty. And how does the tree praise God? What does it have to do? And I think Jess Kilmer hit it on the nose. She says in this poem, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the sweet earth's flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Wisdom in that, right? A tree, a tree gets affected by so much life around it. And yet within that tree, there is such a beauty to behold. There are stories to learn. There is shade to be gotten. There is food to be eaten. There is beauty to behold. And so Ezekiel is um, given a message from God to share with the people of God. At this time when Ezekiel is speaking already, one of the kingdoms of Israel has been taken off into captivity and the next is ready to go. And yet even in the midst of that, Ezekiel is trying to give hope that one day things will turn around. The second kingdom will fall as well, but even in the midst of that, God already has a plan. It's as if you have this beautiful old tree and it's been such a marvelous tree but it has gotten a disease and there's a good chance it will probably die as well. And yet out from that ground where it has decayed something new will grow. This is what Ezekiel says starting with chapter 17 verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprag from the lofty top of a cedar and I will set it out. I will break off the tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it high on a lofty mountain and on that mountain height of Israel I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. And all the trees of the field should know that I am the Lord. I will bring low 
the high tree. I will make high the low tree. I will dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. It is God's doing. It is God's doing of all that there is. See, the problem here is, is that Israel battles within itself saying, are we the strength of our own country or do we let God be God, the God of what we are? As soon as Israel starts to claim that it is by their own power, their own smartness, their own sense of strength is where they begin to start to fall and we are no different in our own lives. How often we say and we put the responsibility, I just need to be smart enough. I just need to be up like everybody else is. I just need to make enough money. I just need to, to look good in the morning. I need to be awake. I need to do this. I need to do that. And yet it is not up to us. We do have responsibilities. I'm not saying we don't. But oftentimes the bottom line of how we judge ourselves is how well things work out. It is all God's doing. The tree does not get to make itself beautiful. The tree already is beautiful. The tree already praises God. The way in which we best praise God is not by just lifting our hands and praising God for our own salvation. But it is being the gift that God has given us to be wherever we are. So in that story, what Ezekiel's talking about, the cedars of Lebanon, the cedars that were built the temple, that's the cedars that are being talked about here. And that tree is going to come down, but a sprig from that tree is being taken up to the mountaintop, which is Jerusalem. And there it will grow. And so what he's talking about is this new kingdom is going to come, even though you, as you know it, the kings are going to be carted off, the people will be taken away, but from that will come a shoot, a Messiah. And as we read from Mark, now the Messiah has come. And what the Israel is thinking about, now we get to be a great country again. Now we get to be a great nation. And that's what the people are looking for. They had no idea that what they were looking at is a new kingdom that was worldwide, that would go to every corner of the world, that all would know that God is God, the great I am. And so they're asking this great, this teacher, what is this kingdom of God? And so Jesus teaches in parables. Parables is a way of teaching that you think you understand what the story is about. From my early adult life, I lived in Alaska and I lived among the native people there. And one of the things that I was taught there was that especially when you are with other native speakers is that it was um, rude or the forms of politeness for them to just tell you you've got this all wrong. I was, a, I was an apprentice carpenter on the pipeline and I was put in charge as an apprentice, which you're not supposed to be, of some of the native uh, people that were also carpenters on there. And one of the things that I had to learn was, and what they were trying to tell me was, was that my ego was too big. And so they told me a story that made no sense at the time. But as I began to wonder why they told that story to me, I saw that I needed to humble myself. This parable in many ways is like that. It, you see the story and you may not get why is Jesus telling this story? And then when you think about it, it starts to make sense. So the first one is about a seed. He said, the kingdom of God is if someone would scatter a seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day. 
and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. So again, that's the parable about the kingdom of God. How does that fit in? I think that they were worried about how do they make this new kingdom work? When we are bringing in the kingdom of God, what is it that I need to do? How are we going to make this happen? And maybe Jesus is saying, you don't need to worry about that. You just be who you are, where you are, doing what you do best when you're loving God with all of your heart and all your mind and your soul and your neighbor as yourself. And then he tells them a second parable. And he also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will be used for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all of the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is grown, sown, it grows up to become the greatest of all shrubs. And it puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in it. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. For those who were still scratching their head, what does this mean? How do we bring about this movement that you're talking about, Jesus? How do we make sure the kingdom of God is going to happen right? The why and the how. When Wendy and I were going to school in Ghana, West Africa, we were told this story, and it it had to do with the early missionaries and their sense of trying to understand the people that they were trying to help to understand the gospel. And the story was told this way, that one night, a watchman was killed. Now in Ghana, most people live what what they call within compounds. There'll be kind of a wall, and within that walled area, you'll have many families living together. And one person would be chosen to be the watchman, and they're walking around, not just watching for people, for strangers, but they're trying to protect the people from snakes. They're trying to protect them from wild beasts that might get in. The watchman had a very important job. Well, this watchman was walking around and all of a sudden the top deck on this building collapsed and it fell on the watchman and killed him. And so the people were asking the missionaries, why did that walkway fall and kill the watchman? And they says, well, we've we've, we've gone in, we've investigated, and what we saw was, was that the posts that were holding the walkway, the upper walkway up, had gotten termites in it, and the termites had eaten the log to the point where the logs fell down. And when they fell, that thing, the the upper deck fell, and then that fell on the night watchman, and that's why. So, you know, I I listen to this story being told, and I go, that makes perfect sense to me. Well, they said, but why did it fall on the night watchman? Why did it fall when it fell? What did he do wrong? Why was it that he was killed? The point was they kept asking those questions that come back to why do things happen? We like to know why things happen, right? Because the more that we understand the world, the more that we can start to control the world, the more that we think that we can be in control of our own destinies. The truth is, is that we can't. Well, there's a lot that we can kind of control. But the bottom line is, God is the one that's in control. It's up to us to be able to live with what has been given to us to make the best of it and to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul and our neighbors as ourselves. 
that seed that was planted and then grows up to be this great mustard plant, right? And so when I'm thinking of a mustard plant, I'm thinking today's Father's Day. I'm thinking I might get a hot dog today and I get to put mustard on it. But no, this mustard seed is not for people to make mustard out of. It grows up so that other birds of the air can land in it, so that it gives shade. We don't know why, but God loves it. It's God's bush that comes from one of the smallest of seeds and that grows up to be so big. This kingdom of God, we can be as smart and we can be as bright and we can have all the plans in the world for how we want this particular congregation here in Walport to grow so all of the pews are filled and everyone's coming to us. And so what do we need to make that happen? How do we get the word out? How do we do this and how do we do that? We can do those things. But we can also just be who we are out in the community. To be the loving people that you are. And others will ask, how come you walk around with such a beautiful smile on your face? How is it that all of this stuff has happened to you, yet you don't give up? You simply tell them. But we come every week back to church, not just to give God glory, but we come to each other in this place because we all have something in common, don't we? God created us to be who we are. To grow up in some ways into that mustard plant for God's glory. We may not look like anybody else, but every single one of us was created by God. We all look different. We all have different experiences. We're all a very unique plant that God has given life to. God loves you just the way you are today. Grow up and to be into that. And when you individually grow up into that, the kingdom of God grows into a giant field of God's love. The third reading is where Paul now is writing to the church in Corinth, Corinth and he is most likely in prison. But he writes this in such a way saying, okay, you're going to have troubles. You're getting frustrated with the way life is. But I want you to look at life like this so you can go forward. And I'm going to read to you from Eugene Peterson's version of the, the message. And so it reads in very contemporary language. And I like how it flows. So listen to this. We know that when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies in heaven. God made, not handmade, and we'll never have to relocate our tents again. That moving, that going on, that place where you are journeying. I know that some of you have used to go on camping trips where you, every night you go to a new campground and you got to put the tent away. Maybe some of you have backpacked where every day you got to clean the tent, you put the tent away and then you travel on to the next place. And if you don't, you end up carrying a lot more dirt than you want. Or some of you know what it is like to move from one place to the next place. Keep hoping that you'll find the place where you want to be. We get tired of that. I cannot imagine what it is like for those that are homeless living out in the woods, that temporary unknown. How do you give them hope? Maybe something in here can help you to figure that out. So he continues, sometimes we can hardly wait to move. And so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions around here seem like a stopover and an unfinished sack. And we're tired of it. We've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. Again, sometimes life is just so hard we want it to end because it just is too difficult. And so we want to be with the great I am. I'm tired of this. And Paul says, just hold on. Said, that's why we live with such good cheer. 
You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. And again, this is Paul talking from the prison. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of our spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in, but we don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us when the time comes? We'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for a homecoming. But neither exile nor homecoming is the main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing, and that's what we aim to do, regardless of our conditions. Sooner or later, we all have to face God, regardless of our conditions. We'll appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, either good or bad. Because of these decisions, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We look at the Messiah that way once, and we got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. So again, what he's reminding of is, is when the Jewish leaders at the time were looking for a Messiah that would be a strong warrior-like, that would bring everyone back with that strong voice. No, that's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. It says, now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with Messiah gets a fresh start and created new. This old life is gone and a new life emerges. Look at it all. All of this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and them and then called us to settle our relationship with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking about, we're speaking for Christ himself. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. I love that last line that he says. You know, God's already a friend of you, though it may not seem like it, especially when you go through hard things. You go, God, how could you allow this to happen to me? What kind of a friend treats me like that? When it's all about us and we see that what happens around must be my fault, there lies the problem. It's not all about us. It's about God's world and we try to be the best that we can but the best that you can be is exactly who you are today as you humble yourself to God as you love those around you with the kind of love that you want to be loved with not what you want to pay back to them because they haven't been so loving to you how do you want to be loved and then love others like that. But it really starts with humbling yourself to God and knowing that you are not God. There is only one God. God, we thank you. We thank you for your scriptures this morning. We thank you for your great love that you have for each and every one of us. Help us to be your people wherever we find ourselves to be praising you like the trees. In your precious name. Amen. There's an affirmation of faith that is printed in your bulletin and it was written um, the confessions are, uh, for the Presbyterians, our confessions are statements that are generally made at a time when the church is going through great difficulties and problems. In 1967, there were race riots. There were, how do we get along with each other? There was a lot of rift going on in our country, but not only in our country, but throughout the world. And this little excerpt from this confession helps to remind us of who we are with God. And so together, if you are willing to read this, Jesus Christ is God with humankind. 
He is the eternal Son of the Father, who became human and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete his mission. This work of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is the foundation of all the confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. And if you're willing to sing along with me, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God, found on page 492. Uh, it's really on 349. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> The news of the family, the announcements that we have, they're printed in the back of the bulletin. Um, this coming Friday is our Bible study by Zoom. We are studying the book of James. It is never too late to start this. The um, web address for that we can get to you if you don't have it. On Saturday is our breakfast for all. Um, every Saturday we have our Saturday breakfast and our food box giveaway for those that are hungry. Um, and then next Sunday, and I'm going to let Scott tell a little bit about what's going to happen next Sunday, but also some good news about our mission giving. Scott, do you mind sharing? Every year, uh, our church joins with uh, churches all over the world, uh, uh, thousands, to, uh, uh, to give uh, special offerings uh, at different points during the year. And uh, 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 the Lord uh, uh, really allowed us to, to participate in the various missions and uh, needs around the world uh, with these uh, the one great hour of sharing, which is given over Easter, uh, was uh, 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 up st substantially this year from last. And uh, $853.73 was given uh, 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 by the con our congregation. Uh, and uh, uh, in 2020, over $4 million worldwide was uh, gathered for, for those needs. Uh, also, uh, the Pentecostal offering uh, uh, in 2020 was uh, $219, and this year it was $525. So, and 40% and of that stays right here in our community. For instance, uh, uh, that particular offering, the Pentecostal offering, goes to teach uh, uh, new and, and young folks that are future leaders in the church and uh, uh, church members um, about Christ and, uh, and how to uh, uh, 
to spread uh, the word of, uh, of Christ's love. Um, uh, $219 uh, in, two, in 2020 and 525 uh, this year. Uh, that 40% uh, uh, will go to our uh, children's library um, here in Walport. Uh, and uh, uh, from that all, uh, another part of our mission uh, is, uh, is directly to work with people uh, uh, there's a couple of cards that you can find out in the foyer on your way out uh, on uh, Basha. Uh, that's a, a group of uh, a women in uh, Bangladesh uh, that were uh, are all survivors of uh, sex uh, trafficking. And uh, uh, they make uh, wonderful textiles. Uh, from uh, uh, from various um, uh, pieces of cloths that, that that they are given, and they're beautiful, uh, uh, very beautiful uh, um, uh, textiles. Uh, there will be uh, Robin Seifert, who's the director of Basha over in Bangladesh, is back uh, on a sabbatical uh, in the states uh, through July, and she is. Uh, has uh, um, uh, agreed to come and uh, and uh, minister to us uh, next week, uh, and uh, so it should be an extremely interesting uh, uh, sermon, and uh, we'll find out uh, from you might say from the horse's mouth uh, just uh, uh, just how things are are done over there to. Uh, uh, to not only allow these women to survive, but uh, 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 to grow from well within and uh, have the support of others as they uh, uh, work in, uh, in a new industry to make a living for themselves. And thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And also, if I am right, Barbara, next week, she will have some things for sale, is that right? Some of the textiles, um, beautiful blankets, and most of these things are made from the old saris. So in Bangladesh, like in India, the saris was the traditional women's dress, long, long pieces of cloth. And what they do when they wear out, um, Basha buys these uh, tech, the, the old saris and then turns them into beautiful blankets. Um, they made face masks for us this year. Um, some of you may be wearing them, but um, she's going to have some of these things. But this, um, what they, what again for those who you don't know about Basha, but it is um, these women who were in the sex trade industry um, were given a way to get out of it and for their children and taught a, a new skill. And Robin directly works with them and has empowered them through this beautiful industry. And Wendy and I, before the pandemic hit, was the last thing that happened back there in that January of 2020, Wendy and I got to go over to Bangladesh and to see it firsthand, amazing. And so we're very fortunate to have Robin here to be able to share her experience. Um, any other announcements? Yes, well next week we're gonna start doing fellowship again. Um, we're going to be outside and we'll have coffee out there for you. We'll bring some chairs out. Um, again, for the next couple months, we'll be doing it out there. And then hopefully, eventually, we'll get the fellowship hall back again when we get the food out of there and into the new old kitchen. I may have said that wrong, but something to that effect. Once we get the kitchen back, I mean, get the fellowship room back, we'll be able to go there. Um, any other announcements? Hearing none. Prayers of the people. What are your joys this week? What are your concerns? And we will pray for them. Yes. Okay. For your grandson, Christopher. Great. Thank you. We will... Those are, those are, that was a thank you, but it's a praise to God for God's work in Christopher's life. Okay. Yes. Good. 
good. That is a real. <laughs> it is. Thank you. We're glad that you were able to join with us and that you had to be here with us. Thank you. Yes, Vio? Yes. Amen to that. Those are great joys. Other joys or prayer concerns. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you back, Joy. Absolutely. Thank you. And Mary, you said something and I couldn't quite hear that one. Uh, yeah. And again, what is her name? Shelly. Shelly. For Shelly, who caught the COVID-19, but then has those long-lasting effects by it, correct? The, I think they call them long-termers or something like that. And again, what is her name? Shelly. Shelly, thank you. We will keep Shelly in our prayers. Thank you. Mark, yes, Joyce. I just want to thank everybody for their prayers. Yes. And I know that we have a new family in the back of the church that just moved here from Las Vegas. And we will continue to keep you in our prayers as you now unpack and, and move into your new home here. And we're just so thankful that you came to join us. And hopefully you can stick around for a little bit and maybe get to know you. Most everyone in this congregation, which you'd find true mostly along the coast, is that most of us came here from somewhere else. Some of us have been here a long time, but <laughs> we all, we know what it is like to find this home here along the coast where we have the ocean that gives us a rhythm um, that, that has, you know, enough moisture. And we like rain here and we complain when we get it, but we complain more when we don't get it because we know what happens. Last year we had um, outbreaks of fire up in Lincoln City about 40 miles north of us where 300 homes burned. But we want to welcome you and so grateful that you've come here to worship with us this day. Thank you. Other prayers? Yes, Barbara. Jim is Jim is the one that arranged it. Good job, Jim. <laughs> it is nice to have beautiful. Wow, gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you for bringing God. Yes, Jan. <laughs> I wondered who was going to come up with that one. I was waiting. Jan, you win, you, you win that. I don't know what you win. But <laughs> we want to thank God for all of the fathers that we have, and especially for those that are here. Um, being honored to be a father is, is an amazing gift. And so we, we but, but to know that we are here because of some father that helped to sire us. Uh, and, and fathers, especially when they are the fathers that, that love and care for their family, we're thankful for. So, good. Good to remember that. Anything else? Let us take these to prayer then. God, we thank you. 
in so many ways so much praise and thank you for this day for the healing in people's lives for those that have come to join with us this day for the praise of the sunshine for the praise of flowers the praise for the simple gift of life this day for the praise of fathers God these are gifts that we can see and we know that each and every day there are so many gifts that you give us that we take them for granted forgive us when we do forgive us when we think that we deserve these gifts remind us that they're all gifts from you and so God when we go through those times in life when it feels like it's not a gift when there is pain when there is hardship God we lift up in particular those who are going through times where healing needs to happen where the ongoing sense of healing and health needs to happen God we lift them up where the pain of the body the pain of the mind God we ask for those we ask prayers for those who who just moved here that they would find a new home here in this place and the place that they have left from that those ties would continue to hold them strong here in this new place God we know that wherever we go you are there as well wherever two or more are gathered in your precious name we know that we can ask and that you will give we know that we ask it in the sense in which you have given us to love our neighbors as ourselves God we lift up all of those who are in need this day the ones spoken of and the ones that are just in our minds that we hold on to God we don't always know how to pray and so you taught us to pray in this way our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. So our congregation does not uh, hand around an offering plate. Uh, started because of the COVID-19. But the offering plate is in the back. But the offering is not just for money. The offering is how you might offer your gifts to those around you. How you might volunteer, be involved in something. Your gifts can be all kinds, but it is your gift to God and to God's kingdom. Um, and so we give them as you go out. If you want to write a note and put it in the offering plate, that's how you might give. That's between you and God. Or if you give a resource, that's where the offering plate is. And now we sing the doxology together as we have given to God. Sing the last three verses, four, five, and six, from which was the first hymn we sang called God of the Sparrow, 
on page 22. children say home. We say home by saying this is the day that the Lord has made and so rejoice and be glad in it. And so I charge you this day to go out from this place. Going out from this place being who you are. Being the tree that God has created you to be. Raising your boughs to praise God. Go out from this place giving shade and shelter your love to those around you. Love God with all of your heart and all your mind and all your soul and your neighbor as yourself. Go out knowing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so take this blessing with you. That you would know that you are a child of God. And that the kingdom of God is all about you. Let go of the fear and hold on to the hope in this good and precious name. Know this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, know that it is God who has blessed you. Amen.